Okay. Uh, Larry Floyd, resident of the Great Great West Side. Sounds good. My name is Edie Jacobs. Uh, my program is Get to Work. I do job placement. Hi, my name is Good Morning. My name is April Roy. I'm on the 25th district. Mm -hmm. But I've seen the advertising, so I want to be here because I was talking to representative of my block. Yeah, absolutely. From information, I try to get them information of what's going on in the neighborhood. Beautiful. Okay. Baby girl. Yes. My name is Desire, and I am a new ambassador for What's Up Rising, my boss, Dr. Mm -hmm. Orr. And I came here to help represent and help learn about what y'all got going on in y'all communities as well. So, yeah. <laughs> Dr. O? Hey, I'm Dr. O. Um, co founder and executive director of Westside Rising. We work in communities that include North London, Austin, Garfield Park, and Humboldt Park. And we work to build a just, livable, and vibrant. Greater West Side for the people that live on the West Side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're West Camera Winter, uh, organized, community organizer with Austin coming together and lifelong Austin resident. Hey, hey. Well, you know, I'm always concerned about what makes it. Awesome. Oh, 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 right. Yeah, it's real deep. The other group is, uh, <laughs> uh, with the uh, well, I'm going to put the other group is the council. Uh, we were hoping this with along with the 25th District Council. And uh, yeah, that's it. Hey. 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 Steve, Steve Robinson, Steve Robinson, Executive Director of the Northwest Austin Council, part of Northwest uh, Westside Rising. Shoot. Part of the Northwest Rising Project. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, the right to petition your government. And that's where your rights as a protester come from. And then the First Amendment you could think of as being the, the, the source of, of all rights on this topic. That's the, the law of the land. It's in our Constitution. But then you have each police department will come up with its own specific rules and regulations about how is it going to protect or enforce people's rights. What, what ways is it going to interact with people on the ground? And so that's a much more specific set of kind of regulations that apply. And in the city of Chicago, with the Chicago Police Department, they have a First Amendment policy, which lays out many more specifics than what are actually in the, the US Constitution itself. So some of what I'm talking about comes straight from the Constitution. Some of what I'm talking about comes from CPD's actual policy on First Amendment rights. A few kind of guiding principles that are important to keep in mind for the entire, the entire talk. Um, first of all, and I don't think I need to tell this crowd this, but what officers are supposed to do and what they should do is obviously different than what they actually do. And so don't, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me that if I say you have a right to record officers, that means that they're going to respect that right 100% of the time. Obviously, we all know many, many horrific documented instances where someone has a right to criticize the police, to record the police, um, to be disrespectful to the police, and yet police officers react with violence or, or, or start arresting the person. Um, and so sometimes as, as a civil rights lawyer, I, I get a little concerned that someone might may take me saying, here's your right, as me saying, throw everything else out the window and just focus on your rights, when really the most important thing is that you be safe in an interaction with the police and that you get home alive. And that means that you have to make a judgment call in any particular encounter about whether or not you want to exercise your right, even though it is 100% or right to do so, or whether you, you're making a call about your safety that maybe it's just not safe for me with this particular out of control officer to be recording or to be calling them a name or something like that. Have you ever experienced these? I've been in protests and I've had really uncomfortable situations with officers that were, I thought, too aggressive, but I haven't had a, a really violent kind of encounter. Um, and I haven't been arrested during the protest. Um, so this last bullet point I think is, is really important for me to emphasize that only you know what safety means for you in a particular situation. So first, the First Amendment to the US Constitution, as I kind of already said, we all know it protects freedom of speech, but it also protects your right to gather together in a group of people and make demands. It protects your right in a collective way to voice your opinion. And so that's what a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today comes straight from these core First Amendment rights to peaceably assemble and to petition the government. So the First Amendment prohibits the government from limiting your right to, to speak, to express yourself, to gather in groups and amplify your message. I'm not gonna go through all these bullet points, but these are sort of ways to think about what aspects of, of your expression the First Amendment protects. And when we, we talk about First Amendment protecting something, what that means is the First Amendment prohibits the government from interfering with your ability to speak, to protest, to carry a sign you know, in front of the Daily Center and demand for something different. And, and it's important to just understand that the First Amendment is a prohibition on the government, and the government includes police officers. That's probably the main government that we encounter day to day. Is the First Amendment doesn't prohibit 
private businesses from doing things. You know, a, a private a mall, a shop, they can kick you out because they don't like what you're saying. And they can't discriminate on the basis of race or, or, or disability or other things. But the First Amendment is about what the government, including the police, can't do to you. The First Amendment doesn't protect all kinds of speech, though, including all kinds of speech at a protest. So here are some examples of kind of these narrow types of speech or expression that the First Amendment doesn't protect. It doesn't protect threats. So if you're aware that someone else is going to view your statement as threatening, you know, if you, if you can't go up to someone and say, um, I'm gonna punch you, and then you, you could be arrested for that, that that's a crime, threatening violence. And you can't then stand up in court and say, oh no, this arrest was unlawful because I have a first amendment right to make violent threats. You don't. But what if you were backing away? And if, you said that. You if, you, away. if you as the person who were making the threat? Right. I mean there could be case case by case situations, you know, where maybe that would that wouldn't really fall under a threat if you were retreating or something like that. But in general, if you're threatening violence, it's probably not something that you're going to be able to hold up the First Amendment in court. So hands by your side. And I said, I'm going to beat your ass. You walk away. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Steve, if that's really going to get That's a threat. That's a threat. Um, it's still a verbal threat. Right. You made the verbal threat that you would be just Yeah. Incitement. Please don't take kindly to that. Yeah. Incitement is if you're kind of directing a group, you know, I mean, this was like Trump on January 6th, if you're calling for a group to engage in unlawful behavior, that's also not protected by the First Amendment. Um, if you're in a protest and you you call on the group to go burn down a building, no, that's, that's illegal, that's not something that you're entitled to under the Constitution. Um, and then defamation, which really doesn't apply as much to protests, but just kind of to give you a sense of where this line is, um, you don't have a right to make knowingly false statements about someone if it harms if it harms that person. Um, so that's what you know lawsuits about defamation and slander come from. Um, is that you have you have a right to speak, but you don't have a right to make falsehoods that you know are false about someone. Um, that can that can still create a lawsuit against you. Bad, you got a bad example with Donald Trump, then. Yeah. Yeah, there, well, there you go. We could, use, we could use Donald Trump examples for a lot of this presentation. He's still running for president. Yeah, he is. Um, so, Josh. Yeah. So, say that the FBI comes up, say that they want to, you know, interview or talk to you. So, do you have the right or to ask the question? Am I the target of this investigation? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have the right to, to ask that question. And they tell you, well, yes, you are, and I have the right to remain silent. Yeah, I mean, the right to remain silent triggers as soon as you're in custody with the police. Uh, and as, as a practical matter, I would say you should always remain silent. Um, if you're if you're under arrest, the moment that you're handcuffed, the moment that you're sitting in a squad car, um, just as a general rule of thumb, even though going back to what I said earlier, is ultimately you're the one in the situation, and you have to worry about your own safety. Uh, but if you're being interviewed in that kind of setting with, I don't know, with the FBI or even just regular law enforcement, that and we'll get to this later on in the presentation. We're talking about being arrested, but your mindset probably should be, other than asking the question, why am I under arrest? You should remain silent and immediately say, I want a lawyer, and I'm not gonna speak until I have a lawyer. I'm looking at your picture, and I'm seeing how they post that I've never been a process before, and I'm seeing how they all on the curb and everything. Mm -hmm. what, is that considered a peaceful protest, or what's considered not a peaceful protest when you are on the sports way, and you are not traffic? Yeah, 
that's a sort of a key distinction is blocking traffic or not. Um, and we'll get to this a little bit further on, but in general, if it's a small protest that's just on the sidewalk and you're not blocking traffic and you're not even really blocking pedestrians, that's the kind of thing that you have a, a right to do without even getting a permit from the city, actually. Um, once you start, once it's blocking traffic, that's a different ball game. And that's the kind of thing where you have to, if you don't go through the process to get a permit from the city, you could, you could risk um, that that could be unlawful. Um, so this picture does show, you know, something that's sort of on the smaller end of the spectrum and staying on the sidewalk, which is uh, sort of the easy, I would say easier way um, without going through more of the administrative hoops to set up the protest with the city. And that leads into the next slide is where can I protest? So under the lawyers that work in the First Amendment area call these traditional public forums, but they're the, the places kind of historically that people gather together and protest. Sidewalks, streets, parks, public plazas, like Daly Plaza, similar um, kinds of public gathering places. And these are areas that are kind of large spaces um, where the First Amendment protection is the strongest. And, and if you're thinking about protesting, those are areas that you can be most uh, secure in, in your right. Going on the Kennedy and blocking traffic is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, where that's criminal behavior and there still can be ways to do it, but it would require a lot of permitting, um, a lot of prearrangement with city officials, um, and could also much more likely end up with people arrested. So we've already been talking about this, but permitting is, is a complicated subject and is really a, largely a case-by-case -case situation. Um, but in general, the smaller the protest, the more likely that it's not interfering with, with people or cars, uh, the more likely that you, don't, that you don't need a permit in advance. And specifically, the Chicago ordinance on this is that um, if you're on the sidewalk and you're not obstructing pedestrians, then you don't need a permit in advance. So a group of five or 10 people should be fine. Um, a much larger gathering that's totally blocking off the sidewalk needs to go through the permitting process. And one of the kind of key uh, ground rules for this whole topic is that the government, whether it's city of Chicago or state or federal, they are not allowed to take sides on an issue. So what I mean by that is if you have people at the, at the DNC that are protesting Biden's immigration policies. And then you also have counter protesters that are on the other side of the issue. The police or the city can't give a permit to one group because it likes their message and then deny a permit to the other group because it doesn't like or, or vice versa. And the police can't be tougher on one group than the other. So this kind of concept of neutrality between opposing views is a really important concept uh, under the First Amendment. So we can be biased? Say that again? So we can be biased? Well, you can be biased, actually, but the government, the, the government can't be biased. But like the too? Like if some of them are citizens too, don't they have the same amendment that we have? So we say that one more time. So if they're citizens too, won't they follow along the same amendment that we have? Be or is it different because of their title? Like if they wasn't, in the, if they originally was in government, but then they stopped working for the government, do they have that First Amendment right? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So the First Amendment creates a set of limitations on what the government can do in order to protect the rights of the people. So there's a, this big distinction between the people who are not government officials 
and the people who are government officials and who are actually acting as officials, like police officers or um, the heads of the city agencies that, that give out permits. So you as, a, as just a community person, community member, private individual, you have the right to speak about any message that you want, you know, as long as it's not um, a criminal threat or something like that that we talked about. Um, but the government officials, they cannot take sides and say, I'm going to retaliate against you or I'm going to deny you a permit because you're speaking, you're taking an opinion that I don't like. They have to remain neutral between different viewpoints. And that's one of the ways that the First Amendment protects people and their right to speak. So this, in, in general, the First Amendment is, is only a limitation on the government. It's, it's, it doesn't limit what private people can do. Does that make sense or did I just make you more confused? No, you made sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so moving on to restrictions that limit what CPD can do to protesters. And this is where we're getting beyond just the Constitution and the First Amendment and into CPD's actual policy on protesters. Um, and this policy applies for any, it doesn't matter how big the demonstration or protest or march is, anytime that you have people expressing themselves this CPD policy governs what the police can and can't do to you. And a little bit of background on, the, on this policy, which Arewa knows very well, is under the, the federal court order called the consent decree that governs CPD, there has been a complete overhaul of CPD's First Amendment policy in order to make it stronger for protecting communities First Amendment rights. So a lot of what I'm about to talk about uh, are relatively new provisions that are new requirements for CPD to comply with that, that communities fought for over the last couple of years and were able to secure and didn't exist five or six years ago. Um, and, well, specifically, were not in place during the George Floyd protests in 2020. So a lot of these, um, these protections that I'm about to talk about are what communities fought for after CPD responded with so much violence and brutality in the summer of 2020. So under CPD's policy, um, the police are not allowed to intimidate protesters or harass them or disrupt them just based on you expressing your views. And we'll talk more about arrest in particular, but police officers should not be, if, if you're peacefully you know, holding up a sign or shouting a message, even if it's something that some people might find ugly or disrespectful or whatever, the police should not be up in your face, they should not be screaming at you under CPD's own policy. Um, they also cannot, they shouldn't be talking to you at all unless a couple of specific things we're gonna talk about. But they should not be commenting on what's on your sign or what you're saying. And they are also not allowed to ask you questions about your views. If you're being arrested, they could try to question you and that um, gets to Larry's question. Larry, right? That gets to your question about um, then you would say I'm remaining silent. But putting aside that kind of criminal interrogation. If you're just holding up a sign as part of a group, they can't ask you, well, why do you think that immigration policy is bad? Or why are you so mad at, the, at, at police brutality? They, they shouldn't be engaging with you at all about, about your statements and your views. Um, and then this last bullet point is about your right to report police. And this is in CPD policy, but it's also straight from the First Amendment itself. So the, you have a First Amendment right to take out your phone and report the police. 
And the only thing you're not allowed to do is record in a way that interferes with the officer's ability to do their job, which makes sense. If they are control, if they're um, conducting traffic or arresting someone, I would absolutely not get in between them and you know the the traffic or in between them and the person that they're arresting as you're trying to record. But if you're staying six, seven, eight feet back from them. Um, it's your right to do, and it's also specifically in CPD's policy. Um, and so they are not allowed to tell you to put away your phone and stop recording. They are not allowed to retaliate against you and arrest you for doing it. You recording them is, is not itself obstructing the police in a way that they can arrest you for. Um, it's good. Yeah, Dr. Orr. I've heard this that you can't lie to the police or the FBI, but they can lie to you to the truth. Well, I, I, the short answer to that is you're right. Um, the police, under Illinois law, this is hard to imagine, but Illinois literally needed to pass a law to at least say that police cannot lie to juveniles. That's prohibited. But you're right, police are technically um, it's a bit complicated in certain areas, but overall, police could lie to adults, and you need to you absolutely keep that in mind when you're dealing with police. That, that, I mean, but I'm talking kind of specifically about um, if you're arrested and they start saying, you know, trying to get you to talk yeah. in that context. Yeah. Um, I mean, but I, I, my question is, is, is a person lying to why is it that a police line to a person is not against the law? The people are supposed to be at a higher yeah. level than police officers. So isn't it a violation of civil rights and constitutional rights? Because if they're lying to supposedly an officer and entity that's above them, yeah. so how is that supposed to work? I think I agree with you that it seems completely unfair and like a double standard that just seems wrong. Yeah. But I think the short answer is that is an unfairness that does exist in our system. Um, the reason is that if you're lying to an officer, that can be considered obstruction of justice. Mm. And so that, like, if you're, if you're knowingly making statements that are false during a criminal investigation, even if you're just a witness, that can be illegal. Um, so that you know, I'm making general statements. Obviously, in specific facts, it can get really tricky, and these, these can end up being whole I mean, court, I agree with that. court I mean, battles over this. But that's I agree with that. But I mean, it's a form of entrapment too. It, it's a form of uh, what do they call it? If you under false pretense, it's it's right. Coercion or under false pretense, like if you might have sell you something under false pretense, that's supposed to be illegal or not able to be done. It's the exact same thing. I think I think the difference there is that um, I mean you making false statements in like selling a product to another person, you're right that there's a lot of laws that prohibit prohibit that. But making a false statement to uh, police officer or law enforcement official, that... No, 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 I, I agree with that. Yeah. I'm talking about the opposite side. I'm talking about the law enforcement. I'm getting us. Right, they're dealing with us. Oh, I know. And they can sit and tell us anything they want to tell us in any room that you don't have to agree with. It. But if they sit and talk to you long enough, <laughs> you can make a decision under their false pretense, under their false intentions. They, they seem to be a lack of with how they operate and interact with people when the people are really supposed to be an awful higher than them. Mm -hmm. So I agree. How is that how do you adhere to people's civil rights if that's allowed? Because what's happening in our communities is they have a lot of latitude and a lot of um, flexibility 
for their own personal judgment <laughs> and their own personal use of their understanding, their strengths. Somebody can get out the bed and have a bad morning, and when you get in the streets and start dealing with people in our communities, that could be a whole monster. Yep. But guess who's at fault? The people in the community are at fault. Despite this person who false information, he had false pretense, was angry, was under mental stress, they get a pass. So how does that uphold people's civil and constitutional rights? And that's what I want to understand. Because even in protests, you can get a pay an officer with a bad, bad day, bad morning. I know I know four people with protests during during uh, COVID and they wind up missing for days. But there's no nothing behind it. There's no, what do you call those penalties or cautionary policies? Those things are not upheld because the majority protect this particular entity and we are just citizens or people. That's what I don't understand. How can we get back to what it's supposed to be, where the people's civil rights trump any government system and that's not I'm sorry. I'm, I digress. I just want to No, I, I mean, everything you said is kind of raising the fundamental problems that we have with CPD. And um, my, my work at the ACLU, the work that Arewa does, and we're in a coalition together um, <coughs> that tries to enforce the consent decree that CPD yeah. is under, this is a years long struggle. I mean, decades long. I mean, 60s, 50s, I mean, this is not, I, yeah, like, totally agree with everything that you're behind your question and everything that your question's getting at. You know, the, there are many ways to answer that <laughs> beyond just like, yeah, yeah. this is a hard struggle. Mm -hmm. One of them is, we could see the, the district counselors as being one form of grassroots community oversight that we now have that we didn't have a year or two ago. Um, and so if you see, and in, in, in district counselors have this, I mean, I don't know what, what you both think about this question, but you have um, access to different channels to raise up concerns from community members that have interactions with completely out of control officers. Um, this is, we're gonna get to this at the end of the presentation, but the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA, is the city agency separate from CPD that investigates allegations of misconduct. So it's COPA's job, they're a professional investigation agency. They're basically the police of the police. And COPA is not perfect, and it's relatively new, but COPA's job is you, file, you a community member, file a complaint against an officer, and then investigators at COPA will interview you, will interview the officers, will watch all the body cam footage that exists, they will look at all the documents and records that are out there, and then they recommend formal discipline, if it's appropriate, if any laws or policies were violated. And there are a lot of problems with even loopholes after discipline is yeah. recommended, yeah. where the superintendent can override it, yeah. um, where the police board doesn't have to agree with it. And so we're really far, we're really far from a true accountability system. Yeah. And even control over the cameras. Who controls the cameras? Yeah, the cops. Yeah. Who's going out? Yeah. Who are we doing? No, I agree. But I mean, body cam, right, body cam footage is only, or body cameras are only as useful as the op, if the officer turns it on and, and doesn't delete the footage and also doesn't watch the footage before being in, interviewed by COPA so that they can like align their story with what did or didn't happen. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I share everything that's in your question. Yes. Yeah. And then, it's my second part is that, so it's one thing for the community to raise these issues, but it's also another thing for people like you, ACLU, and other people to raise these issues and fight for these issues. That we can say something. But there's a disparity, and we all know that. Mm -hmm. And the statistics show that. But we can't be the only people talking. We can't be the only people saying it. And I do know every every challenge, there's every challenge, and every time I speak to power, there's a price.
starts to fail. Mm -hmm. So some of us, we don't mind it because we don't get in the way. But how do we get others like your organization and you to start beginning to speak up for us? Because it's one thing to watch it. It's one thing to talk about it. But when you're on the front line with the people, you begin to get the connection and understanding of what the fight is and what the fight is and what, what really impacts our community. And, you know, we hear all the time why they can't just do this, why they can't just do that. But we have, we, our communities are faced with layers and 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 layers. I could probably sing for, for about 30 more minutes about the layers um, that we have to dig through to even, even get away. But we need you. We need you all. So how can we, and you and me, begin to speak into those rooms and speak to other people that look like us and look like you to say, hey, let's not just sit on the sidelines and say, I see there's a problem and we want to help solve the problem. Let's be on, on, the, on, the, yeah. on the front line with the people. How can you do that and you can send it to other people? Well, I have a lot of business cards with me. So <laughs> I'll give you my card. Everyone can take my card. Um, uh, and I think the short answer is the work that ACLU of Illinois does on our, in our legal department is directly rooted in what community members are telling us they need help with and we need to work on. So what you're asking for is exactly how we work. And you know, this is a little bit of a chapter, but just as one example is our, our team filed a class action against the city trying to reform CPD's racially discriminatory traffic stop practices about 10 months, eight, 10 months ago. And that was grounded in months of community conversations that we had uh, in black and Latino communities, north side, west side, south side, um, with people saying, this was going on for years and it has to stop. I get pulled over four, six, eight times a year, sometimes yeah. more. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been dealing with driving well black forever. Yeah. And so anyway, and so our lawsuit grew out of that. So there is um, real possibility to have conversations like this one and even more one-on-one -on -one conversations and try to get legal advocacy out of that. And I mean, we can't, you know, we have limited resources and small teams, but yeah. Good, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank, you, for you, thank, thank you. you for asking. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. superintendents 
um, and with pressure from different mayors. But city ordinances, which are actually passed by city council, are much harder to change once they're on the books. And state laws are much harder to change once they're on the books. And obviously the state constitution and the US constitution is very, very hard to change. So I guess that's one way to think about like insulating things from, from different administrations is the difference between, I mean, if you can get something passed as a city ordinance, that means it's going to bind future mayors as well and future administrations. Um, yeah. You know, because yeah, you know, more than my that officer is gonna still stay on the force for the next 15, 20 years, that we're gonna be, you know, paying out millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, you know, taxpayer dollars. And uh, I, well, just like okay, so like now what's going on? There's a sock and a lot of times internal, you know, that kneels on the back of this kid out in the suburban area. Well, internal affairs saying that he should be fired. So a lot of time internal affairs, they own internal evaluation recommends that they be fired. And that's why I always tell people I love David Brown. And he would say he fired more cops than anybody else in the whole history of bias. You know, so when when internal affairs get recommended, now this sergeant can still, now he's appealing stuff. What, you got to go through the board and everything else. And the board may end up saying, ah, let them come back on. Mm -hmm. See, so, yeah, it's too much. I mean, you know, what is it, 250 some pages con contract that they have? Yeah, so that, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the amount of loopholes that, that there are for officers to get out of accountability. And, I mean, this is, a long and intense struggle to try to take away some of the power of the police union that tries to do everything that it can um, to keep officers from being held accountable. And our office is heavily involved in that work. A lot of other progressive organizations are. Um, all right, coming back to the presentation. Um, so, use of force during protests and arrests during protests. This is sort of when things get bad, you know, category of topics. Um, here are some of the really important provisions and protections of CPD's own policy that they are supposed to be complying with. So, first of all, the use of physical force. If you are just peacefully exercising your rights, holding up a sign, you know, shouting a, a march, you know, in unison, message, something like that. The police should not be using, they should not be touching you, period. They should not be using any physical force against you. And pepper spray is an example, is a type of, of force. Um, and CPD cannot use pepper spray unless there is a threat or an attack against a person. So they are not allowed to use pepper spray against a crowd just to you know, move the crowd to a different part of the city or something like that. There needs to be an actual threat or an attack that they are responding to using pepper spray. Um, hopefully means that that's something that will be used very, very frequently, unlike what we saw in, during the George Floyd protests. Um, the issue of arrest, this is also a very important uh, limitation on what CP, CPD can do to protesters. If you're exercising your rights during a protest, CPD cannot arrest you unless you pose an immediate threat to another person's safety or to property, or you violate a dispersal order, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, so this is a very important restriction on the police that actually goes beyond what the First Amendment requires. Um, so for example, the First Amendment doesn't protect you if you're committing a crime, and trespassing is a crime. So if you're on, um, if you're on private property and you're holding up a sign, that's trespass. Technically under the First Amendment, you could be arrested for that. But CPD's policy 
goes further and says, no, you can't arrest someone unless they're posing a threat. If they're exercising the First Amendment rights, you can't arrest them unless they're posing a threat to someone else's safety or a threat to property, like if someone's smashing a window or about to smash a window or something like that. So that's really important to know um, about your, what scenarios CPD should not be rounding up people and arresting them during the protests. Um, and then this last point in, highlighted in blue below is CPD's policy says any time that force might be used against you, including pepper spray, officers first have to give the protesters a warning mm. and allow you to comply. Follow the warning first before they start using force against you, which seems like common sense and basic decency to people that you would tell them, um, give them an order and an opportunity to comply first. But we know police officers use force all the time without trying to de-escalate. Say that again. I said they shoot now and ask questions yeah, later. later. Yeah. So the, the next topic is what's called a crowd dispersal order, which is a formal instruction that the police can give to tell the crowd to leave a certain leave a space where they're protesting. And under CPD's policy, and this also comes from First Amendment and cases that that judges have looked at these scenarios and said what the requirements for these crowd dispersal orders are. CPD cannot order the crowd to disperse unless there are at least three people in the immediate area that are engaging in disorderly conduct that's causing or likely to cause substantial harm. So what, what that means in human terms is if there are people that are just together in a group, a large group of people, CPD cannot order you to disperse. But if there are three or more people getting violent with each other, with bystanders, then they can. Or if there are three or more people who are about to smash a public property like street lamps or stop signs or are, you know, uh, about to smash storefront windows or something, then that's when this gets triggered and the police can order the, the crowd to disperse. But they have to give the dispersal order in a very particular way which protects the crowd. And so that's what these, this, these numbered list of three important points is. They have to give the order, it has to be audible and understandable to everyone, so they should be using megaphones or other kind of amplifiers if it's a really big group. They have to clearly explain what the available routes to disperse are. Hmm. And that might not be so relevant if it's a small group of people, but if you have a, a, a march with 5,000 people in it, it could be extremely chaotic and confusing if the police are telling you to disperse and you don't have, and police have blocked off certain routes from traffic, et cetera. So they have to be very clear about we're opening up, you know, Madison and here, and this is where you should go, and you need to, now you need to leave. So they have to be very clear about what the routes are for you to leave. And they have to communicate all of this multiple times in multiple ways. And this really gets into um, language and disability accommodations, because there are obviously people who may be participating in the protest who are deaf or hard of hearing and who need, um, visual signs and cues in order to understand what's being communicated. And there may be people who don't speak English or don't speak English as their first language who need any instructions communicated in multiple languages. So CPD's policy and also federal, federal law on civil rights and disability require that any messages be communicated in ways that people with disability or other language proficiencies can understand. And this kind of gets to your point, Dr. O, about entrapment. Like, if you tell me to disperse, I need to have understood what you're telling me before 
the officer says that you didn't comply with my order. Maybe the reason I didn't comply is because you didn't say it in the language that I speak. Um, can I, can yeah. I add to that one, so, and this isn't just a police department, but this is also a city responsibility as well. And some of this came out of what was happening during the George Floyd uh, protest. And I remember I was downtown for protests with the Alliance and it, it started to get a little intense. And, and I left right before they started letting the bridges and things up. Mm -hmm. So you can't tell people to disperse and then you cut off, you yeah. basically cut off all means of transportation. Not only did they have all the bridges up, but around the same time, they were using city garbage trucks mm -hmm. to cut off the exit ramps all the way from downtown to Laramie. And so, you know, this, this is, it wasn't just CPD. This was yeah, city, this was city, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. engaged in this as well. So hopefully some of this language You're right. you know, can, yeah, because it, it was horrible. I, yeah, I agree with you. Um, you're right that it goes beyond CPD, but I think CPD's policies have to be, CPD has to follow its policies, and I don't think it would be proper for other city agencies to uh, kind of prevent CPD from complying with its own policies. But you're right, the part of having clear routes to leave, in, potentially with a large set of demonstrations involves a lot of agencies um, at the city and making sure that streets are, are open and clear for people. Um, the last point on the slide has to do with if you, what happens if you don't comply with the dispersal order? Um, so that is another scenario where you could be arrested. The police tell you, kind of complying with these specific ways that the dispersal order has to be given, multiple languages, multiple times, um, with clear dis dispersal routes. But if you just ignore it and refuse to leave, then that is illegal, and that could be a basis that you could be arrested. Um, and so if you want to ensure that you avoid arrest, if a dispersal order is given, you, you should respectfully walk away. Um, and you could continue engaging in the protest, potentially in a different area, but at least not in this, in the location where the police are ordering everyone to, to leave. So here are a bunch of additional points about interacting with police, a lot of which apply beyond just the context of protests but are, are really important um, principles and, and know your rights points. So first of all, as a pedestrian, you are not legally required to give officers your name or your ID. And this is a point that a lot of people have confusion on because if you're driving, you do have to give your driver's license if the police ask you to. But as a pedestrian, you don't. You are allowed to be on the street and police cannot compel you to give to give an ID. Um, if they ask for what can you say? Is there any, like when we did the first defense legal aid, they were telling, giving us examples of things we can say if we were mobile. So yeah. what can you say if you're a pedestrian and they are asking for ID and things like that? Well, I think this gets right back to the issue about your own safety versus what are your rights. You have a right to not give them your ID. Mm -hmm. I think in that scenario, I would probably, if they're asking for it, I would, I would probably just give it. Um, but I think, but you could also say, um, if if you don't have your ID on you, for example, right. That's what I was going to say. Well, then, right. then I would just say I don't have it on me. Um, but that don't stop some officers from right. still just trying to no, it doesn't. interrogate you and make sure that you have I an agree. ID. You know? I agree 100%. Right, so. it, it, it doesn't, but you have, you have um, there is no legal basis for the officer to arrest you for not having an ID on you. Mm -hmm. So is there a legal basis for an officer to badger you to give you your name? If you're a pedestrian and you walk up, maybe you're supposed to give me your name because I'm an officer and I ask for this is the language that you, you 
uh, basically every day. I agree. So yeah. now you're saying make a judgment as a black woman. Mm -hmm. First of all, you're supposed to be able to serve me. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two, I have the same rights you have or anyone else has. So do I exercise my rights or do I, oh, here you are, and just perfectly just, um, what do you call it, reinforce that behavior and how you treat people. Those are the, the things that we're facing. Yeah. So if I don't give them, if I choose not to say, you know, I have a legal right, you know, this, mm -hmm. this is a legal stop or whatever you know, legal basis for asking me that, now you mad because yeah. I'm a black woman and I shouldn't say that to you. Mm -hmm. So where 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 is what I guess I'm just trying to find mm -hmm. our inroads. Our inroads, our, our safety space. Yeah. We're talking about this. This is great for us. This is great for any of the work we do. Mm -hmm. But when we're in that situation, this work, this presentation, this information, if it comes out of our mouths, it is viewed as a mm -hmm. attack on your authority, an attack on who you are, an attack on, you know, but you can say the same thing, but it won't be the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead on, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. How do we? And I'm very interested in the solution mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. And I know that that gets down to those personal preferences, but it also gets down to there's no penalties for that type of behavior when it comes to us. Mm -hmm. But there's huge penalties for the minor infractions. <coughs>
I think CPD needs complete, not just policy change and training change, but complete culture change, yes. which starts at the top. I don't know whether this new superintendent is, is up to the task. I don't, um, <laughs> I don't think David Brown is up to the task. And it really starts from the top, meaning the mayor, um, being able to being able to completely change the tone of, right. of you are here to serve all communities, yeah. in particular putting more attention on, on black and Latino communities having officers that address their needs and not as opposed to coming with aggression and force. Um, I think just I I think the 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 CCPSA and district counselors have an important role. Yeah. I think legal organizations like ACLU bringing the kinds of lawsuits that I just mentioned against traffic stops are an important way to try to use federal courts to put really to hopefully order CPD to stop these policies and practices of stopping hundreds of thousands of black and brown people every year for bogus reasons just to search their cars because black people are stereotyped as more likely to be criminal. Um, so I, it's a very, very complicated issue um, with not one easy answer, but um, it highlights, I mean, just getting back to, I think where this started with, well, what if an officer asked for your ID? Like, I don't have, you're right, like as a white person, I can, I can tell you that you're entitled to withhold your ID from an officer as a pedestrian. But that's a different, a different question about whether or not as a, as a black woman, let alone a black man, that's the safest thing to do. Is that with all ages? Say that again. Is that with all ages? Because you know, some police officers say a group of teenagers. Oh, you're right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think it is true for for all ages. Um, Can people put cameras in their cars to record? Is that what this? I think so. Yeah. I heard so cameras in cars. Um. I know I'm already kind of running up again toward the end of my time. So, no, no, it's fine. No, I think this is important. I would rather talk about what you want to talk about than my pre-prepared slides. Um, so just to go through the rest of this pretty, pretty quickly, um, an important question anytime you're stopped with by police, and again, all caveats about how safe or not it is to do this, but to just ask, am I free to go? That's kind of the key way that you can check what the what does the officer think is happening here? Because if they they need probable cause, which is the legal term for a basis to think that you're committing a crime in order to arrest you. And if they don't have that, then most likely you are you're free to go. And so by asking the question, am I free to leave, you can um, gauge what, what the officer thinks is happening at that moment. And if they say yes, then just walk away calmly. If they say no, you're under arrest, then immediately start thinking about your right to remain silent and also that you're not going to speak until you have a lawyer mm -hmm. present. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to searches, CPD very often tries to search people in their cars just by getting the person's consent to mm -hmm. do that. Meaning they might not even have any basis to think of any any um, what's called reasonable, articulable suspicion mm -hmm. to think that there's a crime or probable cause. But if they get your consent, mm -hmm. then the Constitution lets them search. You can always withhold consent. And so that's important to know, to be able, again, safety, different question. I mean, I, I, I understand that, but just know that it's an option that you can vocally say, no, you do not have my permission to search me. I do not consent to this search. Um, that is different than a pat down. A pat down, frisk, where they are doing a quick over the clothing 
frisk to see whether or not you have any weapons, that they can do if they have suspicion that you're armed. And they can do that even without your consent. So, that is, I know. That I know, is, but that, that makes no sense. That's contradictory. I know, I agree, but that's what the, that is the Constitution as interpreted through lots of Supreme Court cases has developed kind of that distinction. So, an officer can drive up and he think you have a weapon on you and he can get your camera? Well, the, it needs to be more than what, what the courts have said is that it needs to be more than just a hunch. They need to have some actual objective facts that they can point to. That you look like the person to think that the person is behind radio scans. Uh, we heard those radio scans. You look like a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's how they get by. Well, we heard some of the radio black male with a hood. Right. We all wear hoods. It's in the It's the twenty level. Yeah. <laughs> we all wear hoods. So, both the Constitution and the CPD's own policy makes very clear that the person's race alone is not a factor that can go toward the officer's decision. The officer cannot be making any decision about policing based in any way on a person's race or any other protected. Uh, characteristic like a person's sex or whether or not they're disabled. Um, but again, we all I know that reality is, is different, but that is that is the law. Um, um, the last bullet point on here is just to the extent it's safe to do so, just making clear to the officer in the moment that you are not you're not disrupting anything. You're not disrupting them, and kind of again, if it's if you feel it's safe, kind of narrating what's happening in the moment. Their body cam should be on. That's required under state law. Is anytime the officer is dealing with a member of the public, any law enforcement interactions, their body cam should be on. It, you know, you're kind of narrating what's actually happening, and that will be hopefully captured on their body cam. So that if you end up filing a complaint with COPA, which investigates the cops, or maybe eventually something more like a lawsuit, then that would be documented in, in the body cam footage. Um, here's just some really quick tips about, about protesting. Um, I am trying to be respectful of everyone's time. So <coughs> Won't spend too much time on this, but just number, number two in particular, I think people can forget about this, and it's important. Is that you know protests get chaotic and things do happen, get out of hand, especially with overzealous policing. So making sure that you have kind of an emergency contact that knows your whereabouts ahead of time, if you're going out to a large protest or a large demonstration. Tell someone where you're gonna be, tell someone what you're doing, and make sure that they know, and then ideally don't go alone, but have a buddy with you, and kind of stay attached at the hip, you know, so that you're not dealing with a, with a scary situation <coughs> by yourself. Um, this next slide is if you are arrested. And I think at this point we've covered a lot of this. Um, but as basic as it sounds, it's hard to forget in the moment and the importance of your right to remain silent and immediately invoke your right to an attorney. So on, on the right uh, side, shade, shaded in blue, is the hotline for the Cook County Public Defender and First Defense Legal Aid. Um, so these are your hotlines to call to have a free lawyer come to the police station. Right. And not just if you are the one arrested, but also if you're a loved one and you know that someone's protesting and then all of a sudden you get a call from them, you 
can call on their behalf the hotline and explain the situation. Um, so under Illinois law and CPD policy, any person arrested has a right to free, three free phone calls within at least three hours of being taken to the police station. Mm -hmm. So you have a right to make up to three calls and that could be to one of these hotlines, it could be to a family member or a friend and tell them that they should call one of these hotlines. Um, and you also have a right to three new phone calls anytime that you, if you're moved to a different police station. Anytime that you're at, a new, if they move you to a different detention location, then you have a right to three new calls to tell someone, here's where I'm at. Can you be asked to be moved to a different detention location? I don't, I don't think you have a right to do that. <laughs> um, okay, and then, and this is the last slide. Um, if you think your rights were violated, here's the contact info. I know, okay, oh, rolling sorry, around. I'm making faces. But, no, it's fine, you're allowed to. Yeah, because you know, when the, when the protests were happening, the officers were covering their badges, they weren't carrying their names, so I know. it's not always so easy to do. No, it's not, it's not easy. Is that legal? It's not. They should no, be, they're they're not. Officers, they should be officers, they should be if they don't have their badges and stuff on their chest. Oh, how, how can they have That's no, a they're not. Going on the protest. Matter of fact, some of them have tape. They right. have black tape over there, badge numbers and names. Is that illegal? It's definitely against CPD policy. It's straight up misconduct yeah. for them to be covering their badge numbers I and also they have to give their name. If, if they think they're going to get into some folly, they cover their numbers. Up. If they know they're legitimately down there to do their job, they shouldn't have a problem with it. But if, if they know they're going to get an opportunity to probably bust a couple of heads, they're going to cover their numbers up and they're definitely not giving you their, their information. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. So hopefully, now that this policy is in place, we're going to see better behavior than we saw in the George Floyd protests. But I know, hopefully, it's a strong word. Um, so here's the, the website and the number for COPA, which is the office that investigates police misconduct. So that's where you can file a formal complaint. And then ACLU of Illinois' online uh, submission form, this is the link at the bottom of this slide for that. So we are always happy to hear what's happened, more than happy, we want to hear, I mean, we're not happy, <laughs> but, but we need to hear what's happening. Um, and so we, we welcome calls if you're experiencing uh, any kind of police misconduct, but especially with protests, um, with the DNC coming up, yeah. more protests that happen in the summer than in cooler months. So right. we, we want to, to know what community members are experiencing. Yeah, I almost think, uh, and, and you know, maybe this is something for us to think about, DeAndre. So I don't necessarily know who's going to be protesting that DNC right, but it, as much as it's good to have this information, I think it's equally as good for people to know what to anticipate and what to look for if they will be. Say, for instance, if there is a, a, a protest again and community members start seeing officers with badges covered up. Like, what is what should be done? Like, who should you call mm -hmm. if they're not being, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. that yeah. kind of thing, you have to think about having that, oh, that kind of awareness for people that are going to be yeah. in the, in the um, protest. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned doing this as uh, one of the civic engagement task forces for ACT. And somebody suggested that I reach out to the DNC because they were still looking for, um, uh, what's the first people called? Uh, the host, whatever they call it. I can't think of the name. Anyway, so they were saying they probably have something already prepared where they can do some sort of educational for the community to talk, at least from that standpoint of uh, protesting, uh, where you should stand, how you can do it, da da da. This piece, though, about you know what we can do in the event that officers are circumventing the law, you know, I, I don't know who we should be reaching out to, you all know? Yeah, I mean, ACLU is one option, but I think if a lot of, I don't know, I think it's a great topic for the district counselors to talk about. Yeah. Is there a more kind of centralized way of trying to track what's happening? Um, hmm. 
Because, yeah, I mean, true. individuals can always can contact the ACLU through through that link um, at the bottom. But hmm. I know that like the district council, each district has like one counselor who's more focused on like community the community concerns, group, yeah. and one that's more focused on right. policy. Yeah. So right, like like that's that's what I do for our council. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, I'll follow up with you all and see if you can help out with something like that. I'll, I'll you know, talk to Arayla and we'll figure out what she'd like to see and then I'll follow up. Yeah, because it could, it could be something as simple as like an info card. Like if you're going to be protesting okay, sure and, and you see officers with badges covered up, call XYZ or if, you know what I'm saying? Like it could That's be something point. as simple as, as that. So. Speaking of, do you have that last slide in, in something like an info card? Um, with our contact, yeah, like that. That right there would be pretty cool. Yeah, I I don't have one a hard copy version of that with me, but y'all have something like that though, where we well, can. I can email it to you. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. And I think with that, would you think that would be okay? Maybe we switch that to. Well, now you said in the event that the, the yeah, like they're doing something that violates that's in violation of, they shouldn't be doing it. Like, what, right. what should people do in the event that those things are happening? Right. So that could be one side. Right, 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 right. And the other side could be like, here's tips to keep in mind if you'll be protesting, if you see officers. Right. X, Y, Z, you know, like that. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I'll get that from you, and then we'll talk more about it and see who, who we need to talk to to kind of put together another fact sheet that could possibly go on the back. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I do yeah, have, yeah. We have a lot of know your rights Tom cards here, so okay. feel free to I'll make sure you're coming, for sure. Thank you very much. I uh, your time. Any last questions for Josh? I know we acted a lot during, so. Okay, cool. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Like I get Josh for talking about this stuff, and I'm Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. I'll I'll give you my card and we can talk about it. Yeah, exactly. What type do you think I am based on this presentation? I do um, you, you said it earlier and then I forgot to ask. Um, I do civil rights law related to police. So how long have you been in that department? I've been with the ACLU for a little over two years. Mm. And you're, you enjoy your work, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you have to. Yeah. I mean, the reason I say that is because I appreciate you. Because as yeah. myself, I have helped people teach you the rights as far as cannabis law. But what you guys do is awesome. I'm telling you guys about it. Thank you. What is the AC you say for you? American Civil Liberties. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right, thank you again. Appreciate you.